Frauds, Myths, and Mysteries by Kenneth L. Fetter. Chapter 2, Epistemology. How you know what you know. Knowing things. The word epistemology means the study of knowledge. How you know what you know. Thinking about it. How does anybody know anything to be actual, truthful, or real? How do we differentiate fact from fantasy in archaeology or in any other field of knowledge? Everybody knows things, but how do we really know these things? For example, suppose I were to ask you to, to name the tallest mountain in the world. Most of you, I'm pretty sure, would respond confidently with the answer Mount Everest, giving the Western name for the mountain that the na native people of Tibet call Chamalung Chalungbunga. I'm sorry if I mispronounced. Goddess of the universe. Most people know that Everest is the tallest mountain in the world. And a few of you might know that its height is about 29,035 feet, 8,850 meters above sea level. Figure 2.1. Did you also know, however, that through though it, the peak of Everest represents the highest point on Earth, it isn't really our planet's tallest mountain? if instead of above sea level, unquote, you define a mountain's height for as the distance from the base to summit. That distinction belongs to Mauna Kea, a mountain in Hawaii whose summit is 33,476 feet, 10,203 meters higher than its base, which is located deep underwater and therefore far below sea level. Mauna Kea, is in fact an astonishing 4,441 feet, 1,354 meters taller than Everest. How about if we, if instead of measuring a mountain's height based on the distance from base to summit or the altitude of its peak, we determine the tallest mountain based on a calculation of the distance of its top from the center of the earth. If we do it that way, Chim Chimborazo in Ecuador is actually the world's tallest mountain, though the altitude of its summit is only 6,310 meters, 20,703 feet. Its location near the equator, where the earth bulges out slightly, might make it the, the planet's tallest mountain. So deciding something as seemingly straightforward as the world's tallest mountain is dependent on how we define tallest, unquote. In any event, however we you define the tallest mountain, the truth is that I have never been to Tibet, Hawaii, or Ecuador. I haven't climbed to the summit of Everest. For example, to confirm that, in fact, I am above every other mountain I can see. For that matter, I haven't measured any of the other tall peaks to compare them to Everest, Ma Mauna, Kia, or Chimborazo. So how do I know anything about mountains in the first place, much less which is the tallest? On the subject of mountains, there is a rundown stone monument on the top of Bear Mountain in the northwestern corner of Connecticut. The monument was built toward the end of the 19th century and marks the highest ground, unquote, in the state. When the monument was built to memorialize this most lofty and auspicious of peaks, the mount, mountain is all of 2,316 feet, 706 meters above sea level. People knew that it was the highest point in the state and wanted to recognize this fact. There is only one problem. In recent times, with more accurate measuring equipment, it has been determined that Bear Mountain is not the highest point in Connecticut. The slope of Mount Frissel, which actually peaks in Massachusetts, reaches a height of 2,380 feet, 725 meters. On the Con Connecticut side of the border, border, eclipsing Bear Mountain by about 64 feet, 20 meters. So people in the late 1800s and early 1900s knew that Bear Mountain was the highest point in Connecticut. Today we know that they really did not know that because it was not true. Even though they thought it was built, was and built a monument saying so. Remember my statement that height 
the height of Everest is 29,035 feet, 8,850 meters. You will find that number in every published or online reference to the Great Peak, but not only after November 1999 until late in 1999, it was believed that the peak of Everest was only 29,028 feet, 8,848 meters above sea level. That figure was determined in 1954 using the best technology available at the, at the time. Our technology for doing such things as measuring elevations is improved dramatically in the intervening years. In a project sponsored by the National Geographic Society, a team of climbers ascended Everest in March of 1999 to remeasure the roof of the world using information gleaned from global positioning systems satellites. It was determined that Everest is actually seven feet higher, 29,035 feet high, and may be growing if only by a small fraction of an inch each year as a result of geological forces. One of the defining characteristics of science is its pursuit of modification and refinement of what we know and how we explain things. Scientists realize they have to be ever vigilant and contrary to what some people seem to think, ever open to new information that enables us to tweak, polish, overhaul, or even overturn what we think we know. Science does not grudgingly admit the need for such refinement or reassessment, but rather embraces it as a fundamental part of the scientific method. But now back to epistemology. You and I have likely never personally assessed or very verified the measurement of Everest, Mauna Kea, or any other mountain. So what criteria can we use to determine if any of what we think we know about these peaks, is it true or accurate? It all comes back to epistemology. How indeed do we know what we think we know? Collection, collecting information, seeing isn't necessarily believing. And generally people collect information in two ways. One, directly through their own experiences and indirectly through Specific information sources such as friends, teachers, parents, books, TV, the internet, and so forth. People tend to think that obtaining information directly and personally by seeing it or experiencing it for themselves is always the best way. Think of the old expression, seeing is believing, unquote. In other words, you can believe something as long as you see it with your own eyes. But there's a problem here. Our eyes aren't all that reliable. In fact, most people are pretty poor observers. For example, the list of animals that people claim to have seen and that turn out to be figments of their imagination is staggering. It is fascinating to read Pliny, a first century thinker, or Topsil, who wrote in the 17th century, and see detailed accounts of the nature and habitats of dragons, griffins, unicorns, mermaids, and so on. Burn 1979. People claimed to have encountered these animals, gave detailed descriptions, and even drew pictures of them. Figure 2.3. Many folks read their books and believed them. Nor are untrained observers very good at identifying, un identifying known living animals or read a lesser panda escaped from the zoo in Rotterdam, Holland in December 1978. Red pandas are very rare and beautiful animals indigenous to China, Tibet, Nepal, and Burma, not Holland. They are distinctive in appearances and cannot be readily mistaken for any other sort of animal, figure 2.4. The zoo informed the press that the panda was missing, hoping the, public the publicity would alert people in the area of the zoo and aid in the panda's return. About the same time the newspapers came out with the panda story, it was found sadly dead along some railroad tracks adjacent to the zoo. Nevertheless, more than 100 sightings of the panda alive were reported to the zoo from all over the Netherlands after the animal was obviously already dead. These reports did not stop until several days after newspapers announced the discovery of the dead panda, von Kampen, 1979. 
I can poke fun at myself on this very point. A couple years ago, I was driving in the early morning uh, along a ma major artery in a highly developed part of town of, sorry, I hate it when it does this. Okay, let me get a close up of the pictures. Of West Hartford, Connecticut, off in the distance, I saw an animal crossing, otherwise empty road. Its butt stuck up in the air, and it moved with a strange lopping stride. With each step, it took a punctuated by a hop. <laughs> Fetter 2014. I racked my brain for what in the world the critter was, and my initial identification was nonsensical. The animal crossing the road appeared to be a Capybara, a giant South American cavy, an animal in the in the guinea pig family. I've never been to South Af America, but I have seen capybaras in zoos, and that was the identification I came up with. No matter how unlikely, after that brief and unexpected encounter, the animal made it to the other side of the road and moved down an embankment. So I figure I never get. A closer look and its identity would would forever remain a mystery. But I got lucky. I slowed down as I crossed what had been the animal's path, looked downhill, and saw it. It wasn't a capybara. It was a raccoon missing one of its front legs. That explained the strange way it walked. That's how our minds work. We see something often in the distance. Maybe it's an animal. Maybe it's an enigmatic enigmatic light in the sky is this something we need to be concerned about we search for an identification and we come up with one based on incomplete data after all it's better to identify the movement in the grass in front of you as crouching lion and respond carefully as the old saying goes it's better to be safe than sorry if you ignore that movement in the grass and it's a lion you might get eaten. If you overreact to that movement in the grass and it's not a lion, you haven't lost anything. Then again, maybe there actually is a wayfaring band of South American uber guinea pigs wandering the byways of central Connecticut. Probably not, but that shouldn't prevent me from getting my own cable show finding capybaras like finding Book Bigfoot. We can be on Animal Planet together. So much for the absolute reliability of first-hand observation. Think about that the next time you read an eyewitness account of the sighting of a Bigfoot, of a, a Sasquatch, the Loch Ness Monster, or a Chupacabra. Collecting information relying on others. In exploring the problems of second-hand information, we run into even more complications when we are not in place to observe something firsthand. We are forced to rely on the quality of someone else's observations, interpretations, and reports as with the reported heights of Mount Everest, Mauna Kea, and Chimborazo. In assessing a report made by others, you need to ask yourself first, ask yourself several questions. How did they obtain the information in the first place? Revelation, intuition, science, what are the motives for providing this inform information? What agenda, religious, philosophical, nationalistic, or otherwise do they have? What is their source of information and how expert are they in the, in the topic? It's getting to the point where many, if not most, people are no longer rely on traditional sources for their news, sources like newspapers or television, news broadcasts, there's no doubt that while a lot of us remain glued to cable news stations, young people, I am talking to you now, are addicted to your Twitter feeds and Facebook postings for the news of the day. The problem with those sources, however, is that there's very little in the way of quality control. Newspapers may not always get it right, but at least they have fact checkers and standards about levels of confirmation needed before they publish anything. Without that, what you read online is often little more than gossip. So if you're interested in human antiquity, what can you do when the fakers aren't so obvious? And 
in what they make up. Again, it comes back to epistemology. How do we know what to think we know? And how do we know what or whom to trust for information about the past? Science playing by the rules. There are always ways to knowledge that are both dependable and reliable. We might not be able to get the to absolute truths about meaning the of existence, but we can figure out quite a bit about our world, about chemistry and biology, psychology and sociology, physics and history, and even prehistory. The techniques used to get at knowledge, we can feel confident in knowledge that is reliable, truthful, and factual are referred to as science. In large part, science is a series of techniques used to maximize the probability of, that what we think we know really reflects the way things are, where we where or will be. Science makes no claim to have all the answers or even to be right all the time. On the contrary, during the process of the growth of knowledge and understanding, science is often wrong. Remember that even as seemingly fundamental a fact as the highest, the height of the tallest mountain on earth is subject to interpretation. How do you define tallest reassessment and correction? The only claim that we do make in science is that if we conscientiously, consistently, explicitly, and vigorously pursue knowledge using some basic techniques and principles, the truth will eventually surface and we can truly know things about the nature of the world in which we find ourselves. Although the application of science can be slow, frustrating, all-consuming enterprise, the basic assumptions we scientists hold are very simple. Whether we are physicists, biologists, or archaeologists, we will work from our underlying principles these principles are quite straightforward, but equally quite crucial. There is a real and knowable universe, the universe which includes stars, planets, animals, and rocks, as well as people, their cultures, and their histories operates according to certain understandable rules or laws. Three, these laws are immutable. That means they do not, in general, change depending on where you are or when you are. These laws can be discerned, studied, and understood by people through careful observation, experimentation, and research. Let's look at these assumptions one at a time. There is a real and knowable universe. In science, we have to agree that there is a real universe out there for us to study, a universe full of stars, humans, animals, I'm sorry, stars, animals, human history, and prehistory that exist, whether we are happy with that reality or not. My favorite quote on this topic comes from John Adams, 1770, the second president of the United States. Quote, facts are stubborn things, and whatever may be our wishes or inclinations or the dictates of our passion, they cannot alter the state of facts and evidence science is based precisely on those stubborn facts. Recently, it has become fashionable to deny this fundamental underpinning of science. A group of thinkers called deconstructionists, deconstructionists, for example, insist that all science and history are merely artificial constructs devoid of any objective reality or truth. To them, there are no facts, stubborn or otherwise. Some deconstructionists go further and describe science itself as a Western myth. It is no more objective and no more real than non-scientific myths. As Theodore Schick and Louis Vaughn, 2010, point out, however, if there is no such thing as an objective truth, then no statements, including this one or any of those made by the deconstructionists themselves, are objectively true. We could know nothing because there would be nothing to know. This is not a useful approach for human beings. Science simply is not the same as myth. Science demands rigorous testing and retesting, and it commonly rejects and discards previous conclusions about the world as a result of such testing. The same cannot be
said for non-scientific explanations about how things work. The universe operates according to understandable laws. In essence, what this means is that there are rules by which the universe works. Stars produce heat and light according to the laws of nuclear physics. Physics. Nothing can go faster than the speed of light. All matter in the universe is attracted to all other matter, the law of gravity. Though human societies are extremely complex systems and people do not operate according to rigid, rigid and un or unchanging rules of behavior, social scientists can nevertheless perceive patterns and regulatories regularities in how human groups react to changes in their environment and how their culture evolve through time. For example, development of complex civilizations in Egypt, China, India, Pakistan, Mesopotamia, Mexico, and Peru was not the result of random processes. Chang 2002, Dim Arrest 2004, Diekel 2004, Hedrick 2007, Lambert Kravalsky, and Sabloff, 1995, Martin, 2008, their trajectories exhibit similar general patterns. This is not to say that all the, of these civilizations are identical any more than we would say that all the stars are identical. On the contrary, they existed in different physical and cultural environments, and so we should expect that they would be different. However, in each case, the rise of civilization was preceded by development of an agricultural economy and socially stratified societies. In each case, civilization was also preceded by some degree of overall population increase as well as increased population density in some areas. In other words, the development of cities. Again, in each case, we find monumental works, pyramids, temples, evidence of long distance trade and development of mathematics, astronomy, and methods of record keeping, usually but not always in the form of writing. The cultures in which civilization developed, though some were unrelated and independent, shared these factors because of non-random patterns of cultural evolution. The point is that everything operates according to rules. In science, we believe that by understanding these rules or laws, we can understand stars, organisms, and even ourselves. The laws are immutable. That the laws do not change under ordinary conditions is a crucial concept in science. A law that works here works there. A law that worked in the past will work today and, when, and will work in the future. For example, if I go to the top of the leaning tower of Pisa today and sim simultaneously drop two balls of unequal mass, they will fall at the same time, same rate and reach the ground at the same time, just as they did when Galileo performed a similar experiment in the 17th century. If I perform the same experiment countless times, the same thing will occur because the laws of the universe, in this case, the law of gravity, do not change through time. They also do not change depending on where you are. Go anywhere on earth and perform the same experiment. You will get the same results. This experiment was even performed by U.S. astronauts on the moon during the Apollo 15 mission. A hammer and a feather were dropped at the same same height and they hit the surface at precisely the same instance. The only reason this will not work on earth is because the feather is caught by the air and the hammer obviously not. Check it out on YouTube. We have no reason to believe that the result would be different anywhere or anyone else. I will leave that YouTube channel by the way at the bottom of this um, reading just so you know. If this assumption of science that the laws do not change through time was false, many of the so-called historical sciences, including prehistoric archaeology, could not exist. For example, historical geologists are interested in knowing how the various landforms we see today came into being. They recognize that they cannot go back in time to see how, for example, Bryce Cannon in Utah was formed 
figure 2.5. However, because the laws of geology that govern the government the development of Bryce Canyon have not changed through time, and because these laws are still in operation, historical geologists can study the formation of geo geological features today and apply what they learned to the past. The same laws they can directly study operating in the past were operating in the past when the geological features that interest them first formed. In the words of the 19th century geologist, Charles Lyell, the present, unquote, we can observe the key, observe is the key to understanding the past that we cannot. This is true because the laws or rules that govern the universe are constant. Those that operate today operated in the past. That is why science does not limit itself to the present, but makes inferences about the past and even predictions about the future. Every weather report includes a prediction about the future. We can do so because oddly while childbed fever took a horrible, I'm so sorry, it flipped two pages. Because we can study modern ongoing phenomena that work under the same laws that existed in the past and will exist in the future. The laws can be understood. This may be the single most important principle in science, the universe of the theoretically at least knowable. It may be complicated and it may take many years to understand even apparently simple phenomena. Each attempt at understanding leads us to collect more data and to test, reevaluate and refine our proposed explanations for how planets formed why a group of animals became extinct, <coughs> excuse me, while another thrived, or how a group of ancient people responded to a change in their natural environment, contact with a group of foreigners, or adoption of new technology. We rarely get it right the first time and are continually collecting new information, abandoning some interpretations while refining others. We constantly rethink our explanations in this way little by little. Bit by bit, we expand our knowledge and understanding, though this kind of careful observation and objective research and experimentation, we can indeed know things. So our assumptions are simple enough. We accept the existence of reality independent of our own minds, and we accept that this reality works according to a series of unchanging patterns, rules, or laws. We also claim that we can recognize and understand these laws or at least recognize the patterns that result from these universal law rules. The question remains then, how do we do science? How do we explore the nature of the universe, whether our interest is planets, stars, atoms, or human prehistory? The workings of science. What is essential to good science is objective, unbiased observations of planets, molecules, rock formations, archaeological sites, and so on. Often on the basis of these specific observations, we propose explanations called hypotheses for how things work. The processes of suggesting general explanations based on specific observations is called induction. For example, we may study the planets Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Each one presents specific bits of information. We then induce general rules about how we think these inner planets in our solar system were formed. Or we might study a whole series of different kinds of molecules and then induce general rules about how molecules interact chemically. We may study different rock formations and make general conclusions about their origin. We can study a number of specific prehistoric sites and make ge generalizations about how cultures evol evolved. Notice that we cannot directly observe planets forming and the rules of molecular interaction, rocks being made, or prehistoric cultures evolving. Instead, we are inducing general conclusions and principles concerning our data that follow logically from what we have been able to observe. This process of induction through critical, through crucial to science is not enough. Oops, sorry. We need to go beyond our induced hypotheses by testing them. If our induced hypotheses are indeed valid, that is, 
They really represent the rules according to which some aspect of, of the universe, planets, molecules, rocks, ancient societies, works they should be able to hold up under the rigors of scientific hypothesis testing. Observation and suggestion of hypothesis, therefore, are only the first steps in a scientific investigation in science. We only need, we always need to go beyond observation and hypothesizing. Excuse me. We need to set up a series of if, dot, dot, then, unquote, statements. If our hypothesis is true, then the following new facts should be discovered. The process of figuring out what new specific data should be observed based on our generalized hypothesis is called deduction. Our results are not always precise and clear cut, especially in a science like archaeology, but this much should be clear. Scientists are not just out there collecting a bunch of interesting facts. Facts are always collected within the context of trying to explain something or of trying a, to test a hypothesis. Childbed fever, a case study in the application of the scientific method. Here's an example of how the pro this process works. In 19th century Europe, the hospital could be a very dangerous place for a woman about to give birth. Death rates in some so-called lying-in wards were horrifically high. The result of what became known as childbed fever, unquote, a seemingly healthy young woman would arrive at the hospital with an unremarkable pregnancy, experience a normal labor, and give birth to a healthy baby. Over the course of the hours and days following birth, however, the mother might exhibit a rapid pulse, high fever, distended and painful abdomen, foul discharge, and delirium, and then would die. Oddly, while ch childbed fever took a horrible toll in hospital deliveries, it was rare or absent in home births. In fact, as Sherwin Newland, Newland 20397, physician and author of a fascinating book on childbed fever, points out a woman was generally much safer as she gave birth on the street or in an alley on her way to the hospital than if she were if she actually arrived there the statistics he gathered certainly support his claim take a look at table 2.1 the 19th century hospital death rates expressed as the number of maternal deaths per every 10,000 births are astonishingly frighteningly high many times higher than home birth death rates in these same cities and contrary to what many of us might have expected, the situation was more complicated for Austria's Vienna General Hospital, where there were two separate maternity divisions, 2.6. Here's a closer look at the chart. So you can see that. Each year, between 6,000 and 7,000 women arrived at the gates of the hospital to give birth, and about half ended up in each of the two divisions. In Division 2, in a given year, on average, about 60 women died soon after giving birth, a death rate of about 2%, which figures out to be to 200 per 10,000. See Table 2.2. Astonishingly, in Division 1, in the same hospital, the number of yearly deaths was more than 10 times higher, with more than 600, 2,000 deaths per 10,000 births, and as many as 800 dying in a given year, a terrifying death rate as high as 27%, Newland, 2003-97. Physicians were, needless to say, appalled by such statistics, and patients were understandably terrified. Many doctors performed autopsies on women who had died of childbed fever and found them ravaged by an aggressive infection and filled with an intensely foul-smelling whitish fluid. Many of these physicians were more than willing to propose a hypothesis suggesting possible causes of the condition. 
Table 2.3, some doctors proposed the ironic and circular explanation that childbed fever had a psychological origin. They suggested that the cause of childbed fever was the fear of getting childbed fever. Back in Vienna at the General Hospital, Ignaz Similwise, a young Hungarian doctor who had been turned down for a couple of plum assignments, ended up by default in obstetric. Obstetrics. I'm so sorry, I can't say that word. Determined to solve the childbed fever riddle. Similwise realized that the general hospital, with its two divisions having very different mortality rates, presented a unique opportunity to experimentally test the various hypotheses proposed to explain childbed fever. Here is the close up. Semmelweis and some of his colleagues at the hospital recognized a handful of potentially important differences <clears throat> between the two obstetrical divisions in the hospital and induced a series of possible explanations for drastic difference in their mortality rates. They suggested, one, Division I tended to be more crowded than Division II. The overcrowding in Division I was a possible cause of the higher mortality rate there. Two women in Division Two were assisted by midwives who directed the women to deliver on their sides, while those in Division One were attended by two by physicians and medical students who kept women on their backs during delivery. Birth positions was a possible cause of the higher mortality rate. Three, there was a psychological factor involved. The hospital priest had to walk through Division I to administer the last rites to dying patients. In other words, perhaps this sight was so upset some women, already weakened by the ordeal of childbirth, that it contributed to their deaths. Four, unlike the women in Division II who were assisted by experiencing experienced midwives using far less invasive techniques, the women in Division I were attended by two by medical students being trained in obstetrics. Uh, Perhaps all of the additional poking and prodding conducted during this, this trainful training was harmful and contributed to the higher death rate of women in Division I. <coughs> Excuse me. These induced hypotheses all sounded good. Each marked a genuine difference between divisions one and two that might have caused the difference in death rate. Simulwise was doing the, what most scientists do in such a situation. He was relying on creativity and imagination and seeking an explanation. Creativity and imagination are just as important to science as good observation. But being creative and imaginative was not enough. It did not help the women who were still dying at an alarming rate. Simon Wise had to go beyond producing possible explanations. He had to test each one of them. So he deduced the necessary implication of each hypothesis. If hypothesis one was correct, then alleviating the crowd in division one should reduce the mortality rate. So they cut down on the crowding in division one. The result, no change. So the first hypothesis was rejected. It had failed the scienti scientists' scientific tests. It did not explain the difference in mortality rates, and it simply could not be correct. Simon Weiss went on to test hypothesis two by changing the birth positions of the women in division one to match those of the women in division two. Again, there was no change, and another hypothesis was rejected. Number three, next to test hypothesis three, the priest was rerouted. Women in division one continued to die. Child bed fever at about five times the rate of those in division two. This hypothesis was reject was also rejected. Number four, to test hypothesis four, it was decided to limit the number of impassive procedures used on the women to train the students in their examination techniques. The statistics showed that this change had no impact on the death rate in, uh, in division one, 10 or 11% of the women continued to die even when fewer students were allowed to examine them inter internally. Then, as so often happens in science, Simon was had a stroke of luck. Well, it was lucky for him, but not for his friend. 
The, that friend, also a doctor, died, and the manner of his death provided Simon Wise with another possible explanation for the problem in Division One. Though Simon Wise's friend was not a woman who had recent who had recently given birth, he did present precisely the same symptoms as did the women who were dying of childbed fever. Most important, this doctor had died of a disease similar to ch a childbed fever soon after accidentally cutting himself during an autopsy. Viruses and bacteria were unknown in the 1840s. Surgical instruments were not sterilized. No special effort was made by doctors to clean their hands, and doctors did not wear gloves during, the, during operations and autopsies. Supposing that there was something bad in dead bodies and this something had entered Simon Wise's friend's system through his wound. Could the same bad stuff Simon Wise called it cadaveric material, unquote, get into, get onto the hands of the physicians and medical students who then might without washing go on to help a woman give birth. Then if this cadaveric material was were transmitted into the woman's body during the birth of her baby, it might lead to her death. The possibility inspired Simon Wise's final hypothesis. The presence of physicians and medical students in Division I was at the root of the mystery. After all, students who attended the women in Division I regularly conducted autopsies as part of their training and so would be in contact with dead bodies on the same days they were assisting women giving birth. Furthermore, physicians who frequently perform autopsies on the bodies of women who had already died of childbirth fever, often going directly from autopsy room to the birthing room, rooms to assist other women in giving birth. Herein, was a grimly ironic twist to this new hypothesis. If there was something bad in dead bodies, the attempt by ph physicians to solve the mystery of childbed fever by performing autopsies on its victims was one of the most important factors in transmitting the disease to additional women. To test this hypothesis, Simon Wise instituted new policies on Division I, including the requirement that all physicians and students cleanse their hands with chlorinated <coughs> excuse me, lime, a bleaching agent before entering the result. The result, the death rates in both division one divisions dropped. See table 2.2. Division two, always the safer one, came down from a rate of 200 to a rate of 130 maternal deaths for every 10,000. Division one declined far more dramatically from the previous cited maternal death rate of 2,000 to a rate of 120 per 10,000 births, Simon Wise had both solved a mystery and halted an epidemic. Science and non-science, the essential differences. Through objective observation and analysis, a scientist, whether a physicist, chemist, biologist, psychologist, or archaeologist, sees things that need explaining. Through creativity and imagination, the scientist induces possibility, possible hypothesis to explain these mysteries. The scientist then sets up a rigorous method through experimentation or subsequent research to deductively test the validity of a given hypothesis. If the implications of a hypothesis are not shown to shown not to be true, the hypothesis must be rejected, and then it's back to the drawing board. If implications are found to be true, we can uphold or support our hypothesis. A number of other points should be made there here. The first is that for a hypothesis, whether it turns out to be upheld or not, to be scientific, it must be testable. In other words, there must be a clear deduced implications that can be drawn from a hypothesis and then tested. Testing a hypothesis is crucial. If there are no specific implications of a hypothesis then that, it, that can be analyzed as a test of validity or usefulness of that hypothesis, then you simply are not doing and cannot do science." Unquote. For example, suppose you observe a person who appears to be able to guess the value of a playing card deck, playing card picked from a deck, next assume that someone hypothesizes that psychic ability is involved. Finally, suppose the claim 
is made that the psychic ability goes away as soon as you try to test it, actually named the shyness effect by some researchers of paranormal. This assertion rens renders the claim of psychic power inherently untestable and therefore not scientific. Beyond the issue of testability, another lesson is involved in determining whether an approach of to a problem is scientific. Simowise induced four different hypotheses to explain the difference in mortality rates between divisions one and two. These competing explanations are called multiple working hypotheses. Notice that Simowise did not simply proceed by a process of elimination. He did not, for example, test the first three hypotheses and after finding them invalid, declare that the fourth was necessarily correct because it was the only one left that he had thought of. Some people try to work that way. A light is, see, is seen in the sky. Someone hypothesis it was a meteor. We find out that it was not. Someone else hypothesizes that it was a military rocket. Again, this turns out to be incorrect. Someone else suggested that suggests that it was a local advertising blimp, but that turns out to have been somewhere else. Finally, someone suggests that it was the spacecraft of beings from another planet. Some will say that this must be correct because none of the other explanations panned out. This is nonsense. There are plenty of other possible explanations. Eliminating all of the explanations we have been able to think about uh, think uh, think of except one which perhaps has no testable implications in no way allows to uphold that final thought hypothesis a rule in assessing explanations <clears throat> finally there is another rule to hypothesis making and testing it is called Oakham's razor or Oakham's rule in thinking in trying to solve a problem or in Attempting to explain some phenomena, entities are not to be multiplied by necessity, unquote. In other words, the hypothesis that explains a series of observations with the fewest other assumptions or leaps, the hypothesis that does not imply, multiply these entities beyond necessity is the best explanation. Another way of stating this fundamental rule of scientific reasoning was expressed by Dr. Theodore Woodward. In the 1940s, Dr. Woodward would notice that his students, student doctors at the University of Maryland School of Medicine often suggested the least plausible and most exotic di of diagnosis for patients presenting with rather mundane symptoms. Woodward's advice to his students Quote, when you hear hoofbeats, think of horses, not zebras, unquote. In other words, go with the most likely diagnosis first. In the vast majority of cases, what looks like a cold is actually a cold and not some rare tropical disease that has been clinically diagnosed in only a handful of people. Expressed most broadly, only when you've eliminated the most likely should you consider more exotic explanations. That applies to light in the sky, an animal seen at the distance, a strange inscription on a cave wall. Consider the case of this symmetrical axe-shaped pieces of chipped stone found in the 17th century in apparently ancient soil layers in Europe. Figure 2.7. Today, anyone looking at these objects would immediately conclude that they were tools that product of human, human ingenuity and labor, Stone Age, artifacts made by our prehistoric ancestors. This common sense interpretation that the objects had been made by a past people was a problematic for many thinkers in past centuries based on a common interpretation of the Bible. There could have been no Stone Age, no period in antiquity when people made tools of stone so the objects and questions in this view <clears throat> could not have been made by ancient human beings thinkers who denied that the stone axes had been made by ancient people had to come up with alternate explanations some were rather fanciful 
Perhaps these hand axes were not the handiwork of ancient human beings, but had been made recently by elves or fairies. Some went so far as to call the stone tools fairy stones. Unquote. Seriously, other scientists disagreed, suggesting instead a more natural but also implausible explanation. Perhaps bolts of lightning struck the earth and produced such objects. These thinkers called the stone objects thunderstones. Unquote. Of course, there was no evidence that elves or fairies actually existed, much less that they occupied their time making stone axes. Similarly, no researcher had found symmetrically chipped stone objects at the location of lightning strikes. Apply Oakham's razor here. Chipped stone objects that looks like tools should be assumed to be the product of human labor. Think horses. Unless and until substantial evidence in support of an alternative explanation, zebras, is forthcoming. Other explanations raise more questions about elves, fairies, and lightnings capacity to make useful tools than they than they answered confirmation bias as the human beings as human beings we are all afflicted by a vexing flaw in our reasoning called confirmation bias blake smith the producer director moderator and sous chef at the wonderfully illuminating and entertaining monster talk podcast and i'll leave this site too and i made up that last job in my list pointed out to me the best literary expression of the meaning of the confirmation bias in a line in the paul simon song the boxer unquote which isn't about a boxer but is a metaphor for all of our lives quote a man hears what he wants to hear and disregards the rest unquote paul nailed it we all have a tendency to hear or see only or at least give priority to those facts that confirm what we already believe or want to believe, and we tend to filter out anything that contradicts what we already think. In the well of our experience, we focus on those observations that bob to the surface because they reinforce what we already believe to be true. At the same time, we push down to the murky bottom of that well. Anything that contradicts what we already take as truth if people if we believe people get weird during a full moon we remember those times when people act strangely when there happens to be a full moon and ignore all those times when nothing particularly weird happens when the moon is full here's the thing scientists are trained to do exactly the opposite at least to an extent of course in biology chemistry geology and archaeology we take note of evidence that seems to support what we already think is going on but we understand what that we need to concentrate much of our attention on those observa observations that suggest that our preconceptions hypothesis or models are in fact dead wrong after all when we when considering any of the enormously complex issues archaeologists deal with, the evolution of our species, the invention of agriculture, the development of civilization, and it's easy to find evidence that at first blush seems to support our existing, pre-existing notions about how the, those things happened. It is far more challenging and robust evaluation about our hypothesis if we test them in a crucible of doubt fueled by observations that appear at least at first glance to contradict that what we believe to be true. It's not always easy and sadly, we do not always apply this approach uniformly and consistently. The Piltdown Frog, chapter four, is a good example and by good, I mean awful. It is the best way by, of achieving and understanding of how the world works and for explaining the trajectory of human antiquity. Absence of evidence or absence of sense. You may have heard the phrase absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. In other words, the lack of convincing or definitive evidence that might prove the existence of entity, ghosts, the Loch Ness Monster, ancient aliens and ancient super civilization or phenomena esp ancient celtic or african or jewish or chinese visitors to the new world 
does not constitute evidence that such things or phenomena don't exist. Fair enough. I don't mean to be snarky. Who am I kidding? I do mean to be snarky. But it's no coincidence that people who want to believe in something that orthodox science rejects or is at least quite skeptical about ESP, astrology, extraterrestrial aliens visiting our planet in antiquity often fall back on this phrase after having to admit that, okay, there isn't really any convincing evidence for the hypothesis or theory, but so what? That does, doesn't prove a thing. How well could you negotiate your way through life with, quote, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, unquote, as your guiding principle? Hey, just because I can't show you the title of to this car doesn't prove I don't own it and it can't sell it and can't sell it to you. Just because there's no evidence that this expensive remedy actually will cure your disease isn't evidence that it can't. Merely because there's not a lick of evidence that extraterrestrial aliens inspired ancient Egyptians to build pyramids doesn't prove that they didn't. That doesn't sound like a terribly good rule to live by. Look, it certainly is reasonable to maintain that there, the mere absence of evidence may not always mean that the thing doesn't exist. Under certain circumstances, the thing in question may simply be very hard to find. Perhaps all evidence of an ancient civilization was entirely destroyed in a great cataclysm like a cemetery impact or the massive eruption of a supervolcano. So nothing is left to find. Sadly, that it that takes a claim out of what out of the realm of science. Scientists rely on empirical evidence saying, well, there can't be any empirical evidence, unquote, isn't a good conversation starter. Regardless, do you want to hung, hang your arguments for an ancient lost civilization like live dinosaurs in Africa or a settlement of Jews in Arizona 2,000 years ago on pleading that the lack of evidence doesn't prove that something isn't real? Figure 2.8. Is that argument all you have? An absence of confirming evidence isn't anything to cheer about, and philosophers have long recognized that under many circumstances, the lack of evidence for something is, in fact, pretty strong evidence that doesn't that it doesn't exist. After all, if we imply the dictum absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence, unquote, universally, all science grinds to a halt because we could never disprove anything. For example, I suppose I tell you that there is a single atom of the rare element protectinum in the room in which you are reading this book. We look long and hard for it. Grab our magnifying glass, open all the drawers in your dresser, shuffle through the papers on your desk, rummage through your closet and not a zilch. Well, a single atom of anything is going to be extremely difficult to find and document. So sure, in this case of, in this case, the absence of evidence of that atom, bring your room is not particularly strong proof for it's not being there. In that case, the absence of evidence is not strong enough, strong evidence for its absence. Now, how about this? Holy crap, there's a velaptiker vel in your room. Velacryptors were carnivorous dinosaurs with feathers. That's why some people call them murder chickens. They were intelligent meat eaters with serrated teeth and sickle-like claws approaching three inches long, three inches along their edges, just as Dr. Alan Grant states in Jurassic Park. The Velocopter could disembowel you with one swift swipe of its claw. So yeah, Velocopters were badass, and you better check if there's one in your room. So look, really hard, maybe for weeks and weeks, but you don't find it or any indirect evidence of for having been in your room you don't find the bodies of any disemboweled roommates this place isn't splattered in blood oh and there are no streaming piles of velactic 
during during scattered about. I'm pretty confident that you know, you'd conclude in that case that the absence of any evidence in your room of a living, breathing rep representative of a species were otherwise certain is extinct provides pretty strong support for the argument that there that it isn't there. Rest assured, most log logicians and philosophers of science would back you up on your conclusion that, in fact, your room is a velocipreture zone. I can't pronounce that. I'm so sorry. So here, absence of evidence is pretty good evidence of absence. When supporters of claims of ancient lost civilizations or the presence of Celts, Phoenicians, Africans, Jews, Egyptians, Chinese, Japanese, etc. in the New World long before Columbus or the Norse dispute archaeological and historical skepticism concerning their existence and justify their faith in those claims because although there isn't any evidence for their presence, this absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence. Remember the velociraptor in the room? Well, there was one there. You'd already be velociraptor kibble, and you wouldn't be reading this anyway, so never mind. The art of science. Don't get the impression that science is a mechanical enterprise. Science is at least partially in art. It takes great creativity to recognize a great a mystery in the first place. You've probably heard the story of how Sir Isaac Newton discovered gravity by watching an apple fall from the tree. Certainly countless apples have, had fallen from countless trees and undoubtedly conked the noggins of multitudes of stunned individuals who never thought much about it. It took a fabulous, fabulously creative individual to even recognize that herein lay a mystery, as recorded by his friend William St Stukeley in 1752, Newton wondered why did why should the apple always descend perpendic perpendicularly <laughs> to the ground? Why should it not go sideways or upwards, but constantly to the earth's center? Assuredly, the reason is that the earth draws it. There must be a drawing power in the matter, Stukely, 1752. It took great imagination to recognize that in this simple observation of an apple falling to the ground rested the eloquence of the fundamental law of the universe. Where do hypotheses come from? Coming up with the hypothesis is not a simple or a mechanical procedure. The scientific process requires creativity Hypotheses arrive as so often in flashes of insight as though plot as through plotting method methodical observation. Consider this example. My field crew and I just finished excavating a 2000 year old Loomis II archaeological site in Connecticut where a broad array of different kinds of stones had been used in make for making tools. Some of the lithics, unquote, came from the sources close to the other site, to the site. Other sources were located at quite a distance, as much as a few hundred miles away. This non-native exotic lithics were universally superior. Tools could be made more easily from the non-local materials and the edges produced were much sharper. At the same time, at the time the site was being excavated, I noticed that there seemed to be a pattern in terms of the size of the individual tools we were recovering, tools made from the local, locally available and generally inferior materials of quartz and basalt were relatively large, and the pieces of rock that showed no evidence of use. Archaeologists call these discarded pieces debitage were also relatively large in contrast the tools made from the superior materials a black flint and two kinds of jasper that originated at a great distance from the site were much smaller even 
inconsequential flakes of exotic stone, pieces you could barely hold between two fingers, showed evidence of use. And only the tiniest flakes were discarded without, other for, without either further modification for use or evidence of use, such for scraping, cutting, or piercing. I thought it was an interesting pattern, but didn't think much of it until about a year later when I was cleaning up the floor of my lab after a class in experimental archaeology where students were replicating stone tools. We used a number of different raw materials in the class and just was the case for the 2000 year old site stone of the inferior quality was readily available a few miles away whereas more desirable material was from more distant sources. As I cleaned up, I noticed that the discarded stone chips left by my students included perfectly serviceable, serviceable pieces of the local, locally available, easy to obtain stone, and only the tiniest fragments of flint and obsidian. We obtained a flint, Flint in New York State from a source about 80 miles from the campus, and we, we received obsidian from Wyoming from a source more than 20 times further farther away, more than 1,600 miles. Suddenly it was clear to me that the pattern apparent at the archaeological site was repeating itself nearly 2,000 years later among my students. More valuable stones, functionally superior and difficult to obtain, was used more efficiently and there was far less waste than in the stone that was easy to obtain and more difficult to work. I could now phrase this insight as a hypothesis and attest it using the, da the site data. More valuable lithic materials were used more efficiently at the Loomis II archeological site, Fetter 1981B, 1981B. In fact, by a number of measurements, this turned out to be precisely the case. The hypothesis itself came to me when I was, wasn't was thinking of anything in particular. I was simply sweeping the floor, testing the hypothesis. Finally, it takes skill and in, in event, inventiveness to suggest ways for testing the hypothesis in question. We must, out of our own heads, be able to invent and then the then part of our if then statements. We need to be able to suggest those things that must be true if our hypothesis is to be supported. There rarely is an art to that. Anyone can claim there were giant human beings in antiquity, chapter three, a mysterious race of ancient mound builders in North America, chapter seven, or a lost continent of Atlantis, chapter eight. But often it takes a truly inventive mind to suggest precisely what archaeologists must find if the hypothesis of their own existence of their existence is indeed to be validated. It's, it might seem obvious that medical researchers, physicists, or chemists working in labs can perform experiments, observe the results, and come to reasonable conclusions about what transpired. But how about historical disciplines, including historical geology, history, and prehistoric archaeology? Researchers in these fields cannot go back in time, but in time to be there when the events they are attempting to describe and explain took place. Can they really know what happened in the past? Yes, they can. But what hist by what historians Michael Shermer and Alex Grobman call a convergence of evidence, for example, in their book, Denying History, Who Says the Holocaust Never Happened and Why Do They Say It? They respond to those who deny what the German, that the Germans attempted to exterminate the Jewish population of Europe in the 1930s and 1940s. After all, even though that era isn't ancient history, we still can't return to observe it for ourselves. So how do we know what really happened? Shermer and Grobman marshal multiple sources of evidence, including documents like letters, speeches, blueprints, and articles, where Ger Germans discuss their plans, eyewitness accounts of individual atrocities, photographs showing the horror 
of the camps, the physical remains of the camps themselves, and inferential evidence like demographic data showing that approximately 6 million European Jews disappeared during this period. Though we cannot travel back in time to the 1940s, these different and independent lines of evidence converge, all pointing in the same direction, allowing us to conclude with absolute certainty that a particular historical event, in this case the Holocaust, actually happened. Indeed, we can show, we can know what happened in history and prehistory. Ultimately, whether or not a science is experimentally based makes little log logical difference in testing hypothesis. Instead of predicting what the results of a <clears throat> given experiment must be, if our induced hypothesis is useful or valid, we predict what new data we must be able to find if a given hypothesis is correct. Testing of hypothesis takes a great deal of thought and we can make a mistake we can make mistakes. We must remember we have a hypothesis, we have the deduced implications, and we have the test. We can make errors at any step in the process. The hypothesis may be incorrect, the implications may be wrong, or the way we test may be incorrect. We test them may be incorrect. Certainly in science, is a scarce commodity. There are always new hypotheses, alternative explanations, and more deductive implications to the test. Nothing is ever finished. Nothing is set in concrete, and nothing is ever defined or raised to the level of religious truth. Skeptics or doubters. You'll often see this claim in popular media reports about groundbreaking scientific discovery. The skeptics were wrong. Like, ha ha, all of you skeptics didn't know what you were talking about now. You have to eat a crow or eat something else. But here's the deal. Skeptics are never really wrong in the sense that it's never wrong to be skeptical unless and until convincing, irrefutable, Evidence is forthcoming. Skeptics are not cynics, people who are, just don't accept anything. Skepticism or cynicism are not synony synonyms. Skeptics express doubt, not denial about a new discovery or new claim or hypothesis. But that's what science does not does until overwhelming evidence is presented. Skepticism and doubt are baked into scientific DNA when we hear about some new find or novel interpretation, our immediate reaction is cool, but I wonder if it's really true. I kind of doubt it, unquote. If you don't like skepticism, you can't be a scientist. Consider this example. In the 1940s, archeologists excavated the Crystal River Mound site on the west coast of Florida in 1966. Two strange features were discovered at the site. Both included upright slabs of stone with one with an image of a human face etched onto it and the, there appeared to be food and chipped stone offerings buried at the base of the inscribed stone. Figure 2.210. That kind of feature had never been seen before or since in North America but vaguely resembles this Stele of the Maya culture in Mexico, Belize, Guatemala, and Honduras. When the site was excavated and continuing to this very day, some suggested that the Crystal River had some maybe even direct contact with the great Maya civilization to the south and that this contact inspired them to mimic those stele. It's, inter it's an interesting po possibility, but most archaeologists were and continue to be skeptical. No definitive evidence confirming the connection has ever been found. No artifacts made from raw materials sourced to the Maya homeland. No Maya hieroglyphs found at Crystal River or any where else in North America, no Maya burials and so on. So doubt skepticism, that's the right move. For now, if future research reveals the kind of confirming proof 
I've just listed, then great, the skepticism will fade away. But that doesn't mean the skeptics would have been wrong when they expressed their skepticism because after all, we're not psychic or clairvoyant and could not have known that supporting evidence would be found. And anyway, I'm skeptical about psychic power in the first place, but that's another story. Here's the close-up of the pictures. The human enterprise of science. Science is an imperfect human endeavor practiced by imperfect human beings. It can be dif difficult for a scientist not to fall in love with a hypothesis because it seems interesting or clever, because it's new and exciting, and mostly because he or she came up with it. But it's a trap that most be must be avoided. Unfortunately, scientists do not always succeed in steering clear of this kind of attachment to an idea. They are sometimes unsuccessful to the point of ignoring contradictory data or even fudging results to better fit a preconceived notion. In a shocking survey, more than 3,200 American scientists, a remarkable 15.3%, confessed that they had ignored specific pieces of data or observations based on a gut feeling that they were inaccurate. Martinson, Anderson, and DeVries, 2005-737. I think those scientists who revealed that they had omitted or ignored data that contradicted their previous work had fallen into the trap of being in love with their own ideas. People fall in love with the other pe people and learn to overlook their imperfections and inconsistencies. And that's probably a good thing, but it's not good with scientific explanations. We don't want to overlook the imperfections and inadequacies and errors in a hypothesis. We want to explore them and in this way, find ways toward better explanations in essence and to extend the analogy far beyond where I should, we need always to be ready for, to file for a divorce from those mistakes, blunders and dead ends, prepare to move on and not look back. Beyond this, scientists are not isolated from their cultures and times in which they live. They share many of the same prejudices and biases of others, members of their societies. Scientists learn from mentors and at universities and inherit their perspectives. It often is quite difficult to go against the scientific grain to question accumulated wisdom and to suggest a new approach or perspective. Of course, it isn't easy for any scientist to question the validity of claims made by well-respected authorities. For example, today we, may, we take it for granted that sometimes quite large extraterrestrial natural objects go streaking across the sky and sometimes even strike the ground. Then they are called meteorites. See figure 2.11. Perhaps you have been lucky to, enough to see a major meteor or bullet in a awesome example of nature's fireworks. But until about 200 years ago, the notion that solid stone or metallic objects originating in space regularly enter Earth's atmosphere and sometimes strike the ground was controversial and in fact rejected by most scientists. In 1704, Sir Isaac Newton categorically rejected the notion that there could be meteors be because he did not believe there could be any cosmological source for them. The quality of an argument and the evidence marshaled in its support should be all that matters in science. The authority or reputation of the scientist should not matter, at least not all that much. Nevertheless, not many scientists were willing to go against the considered opinion of as bright as bright a scientific luminary as Isaac Newton. Even so, a few brave thinkers risked their reputations by concluding that meteors did really did originate in outer space. Their work was roundly criticized, at least for a time, but science is self-corrective. Hypotheses are constantly being refined and retested as new data are collected. In 1794, over the skies of Siena, Italy was 
Italy, there was a spectacular shower of about 3,000 meters, seen by tens of thousands of people, Cowan, 1995. Even then, a non-meteoric explanation was suggested. By coincidence, Mount Vesuvius had erupted just 18 hours before the shower had some time, and some tried to blame the volcano as the source of the objects flaming across the Italian skies. Critics did what they could to dispel the myth of an extraterrestrial source for the streaks of light over Siena, but they could not succeed. Further investigation of subsequent major meteor falls in the late 1700s and early 1800s, as well as examination of the chemical makeup of some of the objects that had actually fallen from the sky. An iron and nickel alloy not found on earth convinced most by the early 19th century that meteors are what we know now know them to be extraterrestrial chunks of stone or metal that flame brightly when they enter our planet's atmosphere. Maybe if they had dash cams back in the 18th century, Newton's Newton wouldn't have been such a skeptic. Here's the video of the major meteorite Ebolide seen over Russia on February 15, 2013. Make sure to leave that video too. In science, we propose a test and tentatively accept but never prove a hypothesis. We keep only those hypotheses that cannot be disproved. As long as a hypothesis holds up under the scrutiny of additional testing through experiment and is not contradicted by new data, we accept it as best explanation so far. Some hypotheses sound good and pass the rigors of initial testing, but are later shown to be inadequate or invalid. Others, for example, are hypothe the hypothesis of biological evolution have held up so well all new data either were or could have been deduced from it that they will probably always be upheld. We usually call these very well supported hypothesis theories. However, it is then the nature of science that no matter how well an explanation of some aspect of reality has held up, we must always be prepared to consider new tests and better explanations. We are interested in knowledge and explanations of the universe that work. As long as these explanations work, we keep them. As soon as they cease, of be, cease being effective, because new data and tests show them to be incomplete or misguided, we discard them and seek new ones. See Table 2.4 for a number of works that discuss the scientific method. I am reminded here of a routine written by and performed by the English comedy troupe Monty Python's Flying Cir Circus. Lamentably, if you are reading this in a college course and you are a traditional college student age in the late teens to early 20s, you might not be familiar with their particular version of hilarity. Then again, if you are at the same if you are that same college student at the same age, you probably have seen one of the Pythoners, John Cleese playing nearly headless Nick in the Harry Potter movies. Anyway, in the aforementioned bit, Cleese plays a vocational guidance counselor who is attempting to help find a new job for Mr. Anchovy, a gentleman unhappy in his present occupation as an accountant. Rather unexpectedly, Mr. Anchovy's enthusiastically expressed hope is to leave accountancy and become, of all things, a lion tamer. Cleese, as a vocational guidance counselor, questions the extraordinary choice and asks Anchovy if he is has an actual qualifications to be a lion tamer. Mr. Anchovy excitedly exclaims, yes, I have a hat and a lion taming hat, unquote. Cleese is more than somewhat taken aback by Mr. Anchovy's rather extraordinary reasoning and regretfully points out to him that were he, were he to call the director of the circus and say, look here, I've got a 45-year-old chartered accountant with me who wants to become a lion tamer, unquote. His first question is not going to be, quote, does he have his own hat, 
unquote. This scenario can almost be literally applied to a wannabe archaeologist who in years past would wear a pilt helmet and and far more recently in Indiana Jones's fedora in an apparent attempt to affect an air of authenticity to his or her pursuits. You'll sometimes see people with no training or background in science, but who aspire to be great, considered great scientists wearing, for no particular reason, white lab coats. There's a researcher, unquote. Sorry about the scarce quotes. I've seen online who wears online who wears a white lab coat while presenting PowerPoints. I guess there's a concern for a toxic chemical spill during his slideshow or something. Look, just because you wear a lab coat, write a blog, tweet about antiquity, or yes, even have your own hat, an authentic archaeology hat, whatever that is, that doesn't make you an archaeologist any more than Mr. Anchovy's hat prepared him to be a lion tamer. Certainly not archaeologists have made great discoveries that ended up changing how we think about human antiquity. For example, Jean-Pierre Houdin who we will discuss in chapter 10, isn't an archaeologist, he's an architect. And based on his expertise, he suggested a way in which the ancient Egyptians may have constructed the pyramids. In that example, Houdin simply brought a different kind of knowledge, a different skill set to the topic, and his contribution have been greatly appreciated. However, with no background in archaeology, or in a different but relevant discipline, the odds are stacked against you that you will somehow prove trained and experienced scientists wrong, <coughs> excuse me, wrong or solved, excuse me, exp <laughs> sorry, prove trained and experienced scientists wrong or solve some intractable, intractable, mystery about the past. It might look good in that hat, but it is unlikely that you'll get right what the scientific community got wrong. Here's the frequently asked questions. And that is the end of chapter two. Thank you.